So what follows is a sample final exam for the course, and we're going to work through solving every problem without using a calculator at any step. Problem 1 solve the following rational inequality, 7 minus 4x squared over x squared minus 5x plus 6 is less than or equal to 0. Now we have a rational function being compared to 0. So the numerator has a single root of even multiplicity because that factor is being squared, and that root is at x equals 7 over 4. That's just by setting the numerator equal to 0. The denominator factors quite nicely as x minus 3 times x minus 2. So the denominator has one root of odd multiplicity at x equals 3 and another root of odd multiplicity at x equals 2. Now that we have fully factored the numerator and denominator, we can make a number line. We mark a root at x equals 7 fourths. Since it was of even multiplicity, there will not be a sign change in this rational function. At x equals 2 and at x equals 3, there's a vertical asymptote, and because they were of odd multiplicity, there will be a sign change at each of these values of x. Now we just need to test a single x value. x equals 0 is easy to compute. If we plug in x equals 0, we simply get 7 squared over 6. The particular value is not that important. We just note that it is a positive number. x equals 0 is to the left of all of these. So we mark our left segment as being positive. Because we do not change sign at this root, the next segment is positive again. We now have a vertical asymptote where we will change sign, so we become negative on this interval, and then we change sign again to become positive. Now we can refer back to our original problem, where is this function less than or equal to zero? So we're going to include the set of all points where we're negative, but also the single root where we are equal to zero. So the solution is the single value of 7 fourths, and then the interval from 2 to 3. We're not including either endpoint of that interval because we have vertical asymptotes. Those values of x are not in the domain to begin with. Problem 2, we have four separate exponential or logarithmic equations to solve. First, we have one logarithm equals another of the same base, and logarithms are one to one, so we simply set the arguments equal to each other. x squared minus 7x plus 12 must equal negative 4x plus 22. We can add 4x and subtract 22 from both sides. Now we have a nice quadratic being set equal to zero. You could use the quadratic formula, or if you see how it factors, x minus 5 times x plus 2 must equal zero. In other words, x could be positive 5 or x could be negative 2. However, we did start with a logarithmic expression, so we should check that these values of x don't cause any domain violations in our original logarithms. So let's go ahead and plug x equals 5 into both expressions that we're going to take a logarithm of. 5 squared minus 7 times 5 plus 12 and negative 4 times 5 plus 22 are both equal to positive 2, and plugging in x equals negative 2 to both sides gives us a positive 30. So both values of x do not cause a problem with our original logarithms, and therefore they are both solutions. For part b, we just need to do some algebra. Specifically, let's cross multiply or multiply both sides by that denominator 1 plus 73.25 times e to the negative 0.23t. That gives us 292 equals 227 plus 227 times, 73.25 times e to the negative 0.23t. Subtracting 227 from both sides gives us 65 equals 227 times 73.25 times e to the negative 0.23t. We can now divide by that constant 227 times 73.25. Now we just have an exponential, so we can take a logarithm of both sides, the natural logarithm specifically. And now the only thing left to solve for t is to divide both sides by negative 0.23. So there we have it. That's the solution to part b. Moving on to part c, we just need to take a log of both sides. Since we have an exponential of base 20, we can go ahead and use a logarithm of base 20. So 7 minus x equals the log base 20 of 4. Solving for x is now quite straightforward. x is 7 minus the log base 20 of 4. For part d, we begin by subtracting 5 from both sides, giving us log base 8 of 9x minus 10 equals 2. We can convert this back into an exponential to say 9x minus 10 equals 8 squared, in other words, 64. Adding 10 to both sides and dividing by 9, we get that x is 74 over 9. Because we did begin with a logarithmic expression, we should go ahead and check that we haven't caused a domain issue. 
So plugging x equals 74 over 9 into that expression, we get 9 times 74 over 9 minus 10. This is the thing we are taking the logarithm of, 9x minus 10, is positive 64, so there's no problem here. So this value of x is in fact a solution. So there are the solutions to parts a, b, c, and d. All right, problem three, radon-222 is a radioactive isotope that exhibits exponential decay. The amount A of T of a sample of radon-222 remaining after T hours is given by A of T equals A sub zero times E to the minus KT, where A sub zero is the initial amount of radon-222, and K is a number that represents the rate of decay. Assume that a scientist has a 190 milligram sample of this isotope. Part A. After 55.3 hours, the amount of radon-222 remaining is 124.82 milligrams. Determine the value of K. So A sub zero is the amount we begin with, 190 milligrams. And we're told after 55.3 hours, the amount remaining is 124.82 milligrams. So A of 55.3 must equal 124.82. But a of 55.3 is also 190, aka a sub zero, times e to the negative 55.3k, because t is 55.3. So we have 124.82 is equal to 190 times e to the negative 55.3k. We can divide both sides by 190, take a natural log, and divide by negative 55.3 to solve for k. So k is equal to negative natural log of 124.82 divided by 190, all divided by 55.3. Part b, how long will it take until only 41 milligrams of radon-222 remains? So now we need to find a time t, but we know that the amount at time t, or a of t, must equal 41. So we set a of t which is 190 times e to the minus kt equal to 41. Now we do have a value for k, but because it's a rather complicated expression, I'm going to leave it as just k until the very end. So we divide by 190, take a natural log, and divide by negative k to get that t must equal negative natural log of 41 over 190 divided by k. Now using the value of k that we solved for in part a, since we're dividing by it, we can reciprocate. Also note that k has its own negative sign, which will cancel out the negative sign in our solution for t, giving us t is equal to 55.3 times the natural log of 41 divided by 190 divided by the natural log of 124.82 over 190. So there is the amount of time it will take until only 41 milligrams remains. Finally, in part C, we're asked to solve for the half-life, in other words, the amount of time it takes for any sample to decay to half its original mass. In other words, if we had started A sub zero as one milligram, what would the time be so that A of T is one half milligram? In other words, one half should equal one times e to the minus kt. And again, we know the value of k, but because it's a complicated expression, it will be convenient to leave it as k until the very end. So we take a natural log of both sides and divide by negative k. Plugging that in, we get t is 55.3 times the natural log of one half divided by the natural log of 124.82 over 190. So there is the half-life of our substance. In other words, the amount of time it will take for the sample to decay to half its original mass. Problem four, let's find an equation for the sinusoidal function graphed below. Now we're looking for something a times either a sine or a cosine of a k times the quantity x minus b plus c. The absolute value of a will be the amplitude, k is the uh, frequency multiplier, it's related to the period, b is our phase shift, and C is the midline value. So we have a maximum value of this function of y equals five at x equals zero, and the next time we see a maximum is at x equals four. Therefore, the distance between these two successive maxima, which is an x distance of four, must be the period. So k is two pi divided by the period, which simplifies to pi over two. Next, we find a minimum value at y equals minus five. So now that we know the maximum height and the minimum height, we can compute the midline as the average of the two, five plus negative five over two, or just zero. That's our value of c. And we can also compute the amplitude as five minus negative five over two, which is just five. So that's the absolute value of a. 
All that remains is to decide where we want the picture of this graph to start, and since we have a maximum at x equals zero, a natural choice is to use the picture that starts at its maximum, which is a cosine curve with a positive coefficient. And since we're starting this at x equals zero, there's no phase shift, b equals zero. So instead of a being plus or minus five, we now know that we're going to use positive five times the cosine of pi over two times the quantity x minus zero, because there is no phase shift, plus zero at the end because the midline is zero. Next up, problem five, we need to establish a trigonometric identity. So as always, we're going to start with the more complicated side and perform operations on it to try to simplify it. The first thing to do is observe we have a secant squared and a tangent squared in the numerator. So I'm gonna use the Pythagorean identity, tan squared theta plus one is equal to secant squared and replace that secant squared with tan squared plus one. Now we have a tan squared theta minus tan squared theta in the numerator, we can cancel those out. So what we started with, secant squared theta minus tan squared theta plus tan theta all divided by secant theta must in fact equal one plus the tangent of theta divided by secant theta. Now observe we're trying to make this look like sine theta plus cos theta, so this is an opportune time to simply rewrite all terms uh, in sines and cosines. Specifically the tangent of theta I replace with sine theta over cos theta and the secant of theta with one over cos theta. Now I'm gonna multiply by cos theta over cos theta to cancel out some of these denominators. And once we distribute that across the numerator and denominator, canceling where appropriate, we get cosine theta plus sine theta, which is exactly what we wanted. Next up in problem six, we have two triangles given and we're supposed to solve them. In other words, find all the missing sides and all the missing angles, or explain why there is no such triangle. So here I'm just putting up little charts of the three sides ABC and the corresponding angles ABC with the given information. And we need to find on the left one angle and two sides. But since we're given two angles of 67 and 75 degrees, the third angle is sort of immediate. We simply subtract those two values from 180. So there's 38 degrees left over. So there is our angle C. Now that we know all of the angles and a single side, the law of sines is the most straightforward way to proceed. So the sine of A over A must equal the sine of C over C. We can solve this for little a, the side length across from the 75 degree angle, and say that A is equal to C times the sine of A over the sine of C. We know the angle A to be 75 degrees, the angle C to be 38 degrees, and the side length C to be four. So side length A must be four times the sine of 75 degrees divided by the sine of 38 degrees. There it goes. Similarly, the sine of B over B must equal sine C over C. We can solve for the length B, plug in the known values of length C and angles B and C to get that length B must equal four times the sine of 67 degrees divided by the sine of 38 degrees. So we found all of the sides and all of the angles in the first triangle. Moving to the right side, note that we have all of the lengths but none of the angles. That is a dead giveaway that you want to use the law of cosines to solve for angles. So here is one form of the law of cosines. a squared plus b squared minus 2ab cosine of the angle c must equal c squared. Solving this for the angle c, subtract a squared, subtract b squared, divide by negative 2ab and take an arc cosine. We have that angle c must be arc cosine of c squared minus a squared minus b squared over negative 2ab. Often you may see this written uh, with the negative sign canceled out to be the arc cosine of a squared plus b squared minus c squared over positive 2ab, same difference, no problem. And for the numbers we have here, we get that the angle c must be the arc cosine of eight squared minus 7.96 squared minus four squared over negative two times four times 7.96. Now we have other forms for the law of cosines. We just have to kind of move around what the A's and B's and C's represent. So similarly, we could get that angle A is the arc cosine of A squared minus B squared minus C squared over negative two BC. And B is the arc cosine of B squared minus A squared minus C squared over negative two AC. And then we just have to plug in the relevant numbers. And there we have it. Again, you could compute all of this if you really wanted. But as far as the mathematics is concerned, we're done. Beyond here, it's just computation. 
for problem seven. Two guy wires, which are wires to stabilize a tall tower. Uh, for a radio tower, make angles with the horizontal of 63 and 33 degrees, as shown in the diagram below. The ground anchors for the wires are 120 feet apart. So the tower is in red, the two stabilizing wires form angles of 63 degrees and 33 degrees, and those two wires are anchored 120 feet apart. We're supposed to find the length of each of the wires and determine what the height of the radio tower is. So we have various angles. We're just gonna fill some stuff in in the triangle on the far right. First, because we have a 63 degree angle with ground, the other side of that is 117 degrees. Now that triangle on the far right, we have two angles of 117 and 33 degrees, subtracting them from 180 gives a missing angle of 30 degrees. Now we can use the law of sines to fill in that right triangle. Much like in the previous problem, we have all of the angles, 30 degrees, 33 degrees, 117 degrees, and we have a single length of 120. So when you have all of the angles in a single length, the law of sines will quickly give you the remaining lengths. I'm gonna call the left wire L and the right wire R. So using the law of sines, the sine of 33 degrees over the length across from that angle, which will be the left wire L, must equal the sine of 30 degrees over 120, the length across from the 30 degree angle. Note that the sine of 30 degrees is exactly one half. So sine of 30 degrees over 120 is just one over 240. This allows us to solve for L as 240 times the sine of 33 degrees. Similarly, using the law of sines, we can say that the sine of 117 degrees over the length of the wire on the right is equal to the sine of 30 degrees over 120, which is still one over 240. So the length on the right is 240 times the sine of 117 degrees. Okay, so we have completed part A. We found the length of each wire. To find the height of the radio tower, it's really only the wire on the right that I care about so much. So imagine the following right triangle. Note we have that 33 degree angle that we were given. The wire length we just determined is 240 times the sine of 117 degrees. Note that we do not know the length of the base of this triangle. That 120 foot measurement was just between the two anchors, but it is not the entire base of this green triangle. We want, however, to find the height of the tower. And now we have a right triangle. We have a single angle marked off of 33 degrees. We want H, which is across from this angle. And we know the hypotenuse of the right triangle is 240 times the sine of 117 degrees. So the appropriate trigonometric ratio to use here would be sine. The sine of 33 degrees is the opposite length H divided by the hypotenuse 240 times the sine of 117 degrees. We can quickly solve for H. The height of this radio tower is 240 times the sine of 33 degrees times the sine of 117 degrees.